Welcome to a really special episode of The Nero Show featuring Joe from China Cycling. Today we're going to talk about counterfeit frames, how brands make changes to the shared moulds they use, what trends he's seeing on the ground in China, both domestically and in the industry. And he gives us a really interesting insight using his data from Panda Podium on who's actually buying a lot of these Chinese products. All right, let's get into it. Can you talk about the mould stuff? Because I find that really interesting. Yeah. We hear that, like, you hear this frame open mould. And the uh, brands share molds and all and and all that kind of stuff. What is what is the reality of that? Are you do you physically because we, we've seen the the images of you know the molds? Is it is it something like you you buy a, a licensing agreement for a certain number of um, uses of that of that mold, and then that brand another brand will come along and go, oh yeah, we like that mold as well. Can can we use that for five thousand molds as well? Is that is that kind of how what's how uh, so this yeah, works? So yeah, there's a bit of everything. So uh, open mold is usually so this factory has this frame, and anyone can come along and order however many they want of it, and they'll slap your logo on it and 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 sell it to you. Basically, that's more of like your traditional open mold in a sense. But then the other thing that happens, let's say this factory, let's say they develop frames for like let's say they produce frames, sorry, for like five or six different brands. And lots of the brands, especially the Chinese brands, but also some of the some of the overseas brands, like the more boutique brands that we we think of and stuff, like they don't actually have their own R and D that's that good. Like they just like their head office might just be for marketing. There's not much R and D there, and so lots of the R and D happens at the factory level. So what will happen? The factory themselves will uh, reach out to some frame designers, like in Italy or wherever, and they'll get them every year to design them like five different frames. Then the factory will have these frame designs and they'll work on the layup for it and stuff and they'll like develop the frame. So by the end of it, they'll, they'll maybe just develop one size at first and make a sample, but they'll have all the specs of the frame, the weight of it, et cetera, et cetera. And then basically they'll probably go through the pecking order of their customers. From the customer who places the most orders first, they'll take their best frame to him first and say, yo, we've got this frame. Would you like to buy this frame uh, for use next year? And so... If, if their quantity is high, then if, sorry, if their production quantity is high, they won't even sell, have to sell it to them. They'll just let you use it for free because the factory is going to make money on you selling the frame. But lower down the pecking order when your production units is less and less, like they'll sell you the rights to use this frame. And maybe if, you've not, if the brand is a small niche brand, then they can just uh, buy the rights to sell the frame in just their country for less money. And in the factory, they can sell the rights to use this mold to like seven different brands, maybe like a small niche a Danish brand and then a small French brand and a small American brand. They can all have exclusive rights to use this mold, have this frame in, in their country. And so lots of factories do this. And I'd guess that would be more what you call like a shared, a shared mold. Uh, and yeah, so the factories will just every year have this lineup of frames and go like and see who they can sell it to with the goal of obviously getting everyone to build more frames. With that example, um, just out of curiosity, what what sort of volume are, we, are you looking at for these smaller level frames? Is it like they're buying a thousand, or is that is that really small? Would it you would you have to be ten thousand to be in that ballpark? So uh, if you want to share a mold in one country. You're probably looking at even like just annual annual orders of like two to three hundred is is probably enough to get like exclusive rights for your country. The upshot of this is that uh, when you look at especially these niche uh, like more boutique brands, you'll see lots of frames that look the same, and people will say like, "Oh, it's just an open mold frame." Like, eh, it's not really an open mold frame, but okay, the brand probably didn't develop it, uh, but. The, I, I checked our last podcast, and the most replayed section was when I said, "If it looks like <laughs> if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it's a duck." So yeah, I'll I'll refer back to my previous statement. But it also sometimes work where if you have a small niche brand, let's say you have a small American brand, and they do have a good R and D team, and they're uh, you know they're um, they're selling it just in America or whatever, like they're the factory. Maybe they have an, another Italian brand customer or whatever. When they're visiting the factory one day, they might say, oh, that's a nice frame. Uh, go talk to that brand for me and tell them, ask them if I can use this frame. And every time I sell one, I'll give them $50 or whatever. And so this happens as well. So 
sometimes you do have a frame that's developed by a small brand in, in country X, and then the same factory, one of their other customers, sees it, likes it, and then the factory acts as like a middleman because it's win-win for the factory. They don't have to open another mold. They can just make more units. And so, yeah, they'll have an, a nice system where uh, brand B is paying brand A royalties to use their uh, mold and stuff. So yeah. Let's say the two, these two companies or two brands are using the same mold. They're ultimately going to sell them as different bikes. Is there wiggle room in terms of the way these are laid up and built? Because we talk about this a lot, Jesse, like, you know, the layup and how that affects the ride and the, the weight and the feel and the stiffness, et cetera. So even though they're using the same mould, is there is there variation in in the way the actual production process happens that, that ultimately will give you a different bike, even though it's essentially uh, yeah. the same yeah. mould? So, uh the factory always wants the easy life and have all the customers using the same layup and stuff. But like the customers, when I say customers, I mean like the brands, sorry, because they're the factory's customer. Like the uh, brand. Yep. they might yep. have different requirements yep. and might have be selling the frame at totally different prices and therefore they can afford uh, totally different costs for production. Um, you know, if we're talking about the actual carbon fiber, you know, like T700, T800, one square meter, Cost like 30 renminbi, which I guess is like, uh, what's 30 renminbi? Three, like five-ish dollars, whereas T1100 costs 20 times more. So like a hundred dollars. So yeah, just Jesus. using a small piece of T1100 or whatever, like put, put the cost a whole bunch. But if you're selling the frame for twice as much, that extra bit of cost is nothing. So there will be some differences in layup. And then also I think the biggest one which is a bit of a, sh a shady area in my opinion, is like QC standards. Like different brands have different mm. QC standards. And then this opens the door for some bad things to happen. So let's say you, you're producing the same frame for four customers. One has high QC standards. One has so-so QC standards. One has low QC standards. You know what's going to happen. All of the best frames are going to go to this guy. All of the air frames are going to go to this guy, and all of the dregs are going to go to this guy. So that's such an underrated comp. Like, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's nailed it. So yeah, uh, happens a lot with lots lots of things as well, uh, and so, like sometimes it's generally just like the appearance, like it's not affecting the the quality. And I'd say like while I say like QC standards, like I'm not saying that the bottom stuff is dangerous stuff, but it just be you know there'd be There'd be, you know, imperfections in the carbon or, or you know, it's uh, been, been rubbed, it's been, they're called, uh, I, I don't even know the English word. Uh, when they sand down the frame, sometimes they sand too much and go through a layer that they shouldn't go through. Like, it's not dangerous, but it looks bad and it's not, it's uh, less than ideal, as Rao would say. What's the Chinese, what's the Chinese or the Mandarin for it? Uh, chow more. Yeah. Like Good, just, now uh, I can look at the frame over... and go chow more. Just on the bunch, just chow more. <laughs> that's, the, that's the new, that's the new, it's a dog of a bike, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> just staying on the the layup chat uh, i just want your personal opinion there's a bit of um discussion now around how the frames actually ride and you'll hear it so patrick lino who's reviewed a lot of the the the, the chinese bikes he's reviewed them all and he kind of compares them to each other and then he got on a giant propel and he's like yeah this blows everything out of the water what do you have any if you've ridden any of these brands, are there any of these uh, sort of Chinese brands you think do compete ride quality wise with a Western brand? Do you think a lot of them compete? What's what's the cream of the crop of the the Chinese frames if you've ridden them? Yeah, yeah, uh, I think it's I think it's also pretty tough as well for several reasons. So uh, number one, I think like it's always give and take, right? So if you want ride quality, you get, you're usually going to be losing some some performance uh, in, in terms of stiffness. Um, obviously, there's, there's optimizations you can do where you can have a bit of both, but it's usually a trade-off. Like so many things in engineering in general, but especially in frame design, is a, is a trade-off. You can't have your cake and eat it. So like, um, yeah, when someone talks about ride quality, like I think ride quality is less about like the raw materials that you use and more about how you use them. And I definitely think like bigger brands, they'll put more time into just refining the layup. So, you know, uh, I think the, the Chinese factories, they have lots of experience with carbon fiber. 
and they can make you the mathematically or physically the most optimized frame layup, but it may not have the ride qualities that certain cyclists like. And again, this is a, another bag of worms because A, different cyclists like different ride qualities and B, what feels fast and what rides fast is totally different. Uh, like I did my sub six for six, I made that Tavello uh, a few weeks ago and that bike feels boring to ride, but it's so fast. Like I think one of the reasons it, is it feels boring is because it does seem to absorb lots of the road chatter and stuff. But that to me personally just feels boring. Like, uh, I mean, yeah. So again, I think different riders would have different opinions on stuff. Another thing that I find is a big question mark. Like Patrick Lino is like, you know, one... 1.88 meters tall or whatever, I'm like 1.68 meters tall. So he's riding much larger frames than me and it might be totally, totally different uh, experience. Like, there's, I think it's really hard to put to, for one person to ride like an XS and an XL and try to compare them um, because obviously, you know, a guy who can fit on an XL probably can't fit on an XS, but I am pretty interested in, of, of the difference in ride qualities. I think Specialized are one of the brands that, that put a lot of uh, resources into that, like trying to make sure that every bike in their range like rides the same, whether it's a, what's the smallest tarmac now, a 40, a 46 or 44, I can't remember, like rides the same as the 58, whatever, like that's really hard to do, especially when everyone's using the same wheels and stuff. But uh, yeah, so back to your question, uh, when Patrick Lino says the giant rides better than this or b better than that, like I'd say it's hard to quantify what better is. Um, but yeah, I think the, the crux of it is what is good on paper so what the factory likes to do is they'll build the frame, they'll have the weight of it, and then they'll put it on their jig. And so the jig, they'll measure like three things, like bucket, bottom bracket stiffness, like, you know, I put 100 newtons in the bottom bracket, how many degrees does the bottom bracket move? And then the same thing at the head tube, blah, blah, blah. And they have their numbers that they think are good numbers because this is what their Western brands from 10 years ago told them were good numbers, you know, like, the head tube has to have at least 100 newtons per degree of stiffness. And so, okay, they just put that as their goal. And so the factory is very good at like optimizing the layup to make the frame as light as possible to like hit that goal. But how it actually rides on the road and how, how a cyclist will uh, review it, uh, I think is, is the question mark. But again, I think it's hard for the factory because not only because lots of them don't ride bikes themselves, but just because every cyclist has different feelings of what a, a good riding bike is. So uh, your original question is, what is the best riding uh, Chinese bike? Like uh, my answer is like, I'm not sure because I think different people have different answers of, uh, of what good riding is. But the Trigon from Taiwan, uh, the Trigon that I rode on the channel a few months ago, that thing rode like nice. Like I think when people say like nice ride qualities, I think the Trigon is a good example of like uh, what people would be alluding to. Did you watch uh, Froomey's tour of the, uh, the, the Factor factory? I did. Joe? I did. I did. So uh, uh, can, I, can I quickly ask you just about this? Because this, it was just, I don't know. Did, did you see any of this, Jesse? It was, it was. That was so good. Like I thought that was so good. That first half of Wasn't that video. Wasn't it awesome? Oh yeah. man, that was good. I don't know why yeah. he did the rest yeah. of it. The second <laughs> half. So, um. I don't know where to start with this, but is that actually what it's like? Because I, I know this is, I never actually put put that sort of those images into into reality. That you essentially just have someone sitting down, laying carbon into a mold, building your bike. Like there it is happening right there. Is is that is that the actual process? Yeah. So that is exactly how it is. So first of all, that video. Uh, so factor. The boss of Factor, Rob Jolentis, like he is proper OG. Like uh, he's, yeah, he's not just a guy they, they roll out for the marketing, whatever. Like the guy uh, is as, as close to the center of the uh, carbon bike industry as you can be. Like he's a proper OG guy, like a former pro cyclist. Uh, even now he's a super strong cyclist as well. Like uh, he does crazy like uh, single rides around the whole island of Taiwan, like 500 kilometers or something crazy. He's uh, yeah, Don so of the Chinese he, carbon mafia. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe we'll say Asian because we might be offending some people. Um, but yeah, well, yeah. So Rob, he's been in the game for ages, and uh, Factor. Uh, uh, you know, I, I I think I rate Factor. If I if I was a uh, if I had more money in my pocket, I might I might buy a Factor. 
and so that video that that was that was fairly accurate uh i'd say there was some stuff in there which was a bit uh you know, sometimes what people don't say is more significant than what they do say or whatever. But no, what you saw there of how they're making the frames, it's, it's, that's how it is. Um, so that is their production factory in Taichung. They also have a production fa factory here in, in, in Xiamen, in, in Tong'en, uh, which is also pretty weird, right? Because so in that video, I think they had three girls doing the layup. And he said that it takes one girl like four hours to do a frame. So one of those girls is doing like two frames a day. So this, uh, that would be like uh, six frames. Yeah, so six frames coming out a day. So at that production rate, that would, like it would take them like two or three months to make all of the frames for the, the Israel Premier Tech or whatever. So obviously it's not just that factory that's doing it. So then to me, it's like, well, which frames do you make at this factory? Which frames do you make at the other factory? Like do all the pros get the ones from this factory where it's your best woman and she can, she's allowed to take her time with it? And then all the consumers get the one where they only have two hours to do the layup and the layup's different and stuff. So I always find it weird when, you know, when people show you behind the curtain, but they don't show you everything behind the curtain. It's always, eh, yeah. Um, but no, that is what happens. Literally, you know, you get, a, you get a box from further down in the production line, which has little numbers on each ply of carbon fiber. And so when you're new to a frame, you have a piece of paper next year that tells you, you know, which piece, which piece of carbon to put where and what angle to put it on it and stuff. Um, and I think I mentioned in the, in the last show, like the advantage that bigger factories and, and, and bigger brands have is that that woman doing that layup all day, she's just doing the same frame, the same size. So I think in that video, I couldn't see the piece of paper next to her that tells her how to do the layup. So she must've done that layup so many times that she just knows it off by heart. And so that is when you're going to get the best quality of frames. When the person doing the layup knows exactly what they're doing to the millimeter, they know exactly where to put this piece of carbon. And uh, that's, yeah, you're going to end up with the best frames that way. Because smaller factories where in the morning you're making a size 49, in the afternoon you're making a size 58, like literally you're looking at the piece of paper, doing it, looking at the piece of paper, doing it. It takes you a lot longer to do it. And, you know, there's more, there's more chance of a mistake happening or whatever. So, uh, yeah, that video... Uh, is an accurate portrayal of what happens and uh, and yeah credit credit to factor for showing for showing some of the process have we have we chatted about Chinese group sets or or should I just sort of say what's what's happened here because I think last time we were chatting it was they were the it felt like we we're at the crest of a wave and it was about to like sweep everything away across the market but I don't know, there's been a combination of factors like bizarre releases, you know, teething problems with the products themselves, availability, distribution. Like what are you seeing on Panda Podium? Uh, is the group set, is the L2 trend, where are we at with it? Are we in, are we in a freeze? Yeah, so a good question. Um, so this bike behind me, I'm currently building up with uh, L2's new electronic gravel group set. Uh, but again, uh, Trace Fellow also got one of these group sets and he had an issue with his or he's had two issues with his. So, uh, yeah, same old story with that. We'll see if I have the same issues or not. Uh, and then on my other bike, which is just off camera, I have uh, uh, the other wireless group set from Wheeltop. I like that one because it's available in rim brake. So I've got now rim brake uh, wireless Chinese group set. But yeah, to answer your question... This could be a this could be a two hour podcast in itself. Uh, let's let's try like crunch it down. So uh, yeah, I think there was kind of like a backlash, right? So uh, all this Chinese stuff usually it's it's birth to the world is is from YouTube. It seems to be, but then all of these Chinese group sets started to get a bad reputation even on YouTube, right? Like so usually on the YouTube stuff it's like oh. It's a good product. It's got this problem, but you know it's good for the price. But I think for lots of the the Chinese group sets, like they didn't even meet that standard, right? It was like, don't buy this unless you really want to like pull your own hair out and stuff. Something, you know. Um, lots of people were having less than stellar experiences, uh, and yeah, I think this caused a bit of a backlash in in their popularity overseas as well. And then for me personally, or let like for Panda Podium as well, so. I was hesitant to stock ERX, like the L2 electronic group set. Uh, I was hesitant to stock it for ages. Uh, just like three weeks ago is the first time I've listed it on the on the site. 
But even so, I'm selling it in super limited quantities and I'll make sure like it says on the on the description very clearly like, yo, this isn't the most stable thing in the world. Like um, if you have any issues, we'll be here for you. But like, you know, um, this isn't going to be just, you know, plug and play like your 105. But L2 are pretty confident that they've uh, ironed out all of the bugs. Uh, it, they told me that, you know, they show me, you know, what problems they had before and how to fix them, yada, yada, yada. And so, yeah, I, I've listed ERX on there now, but I'm not shouting about it. Uh, I'm not pushing it. And uh, the other day, <laughs> ironically, um, our website, because we encourage all of our customers after they buy something to come and leave a review, because that's what I want Panda Podium to be, like this whole community where, you know, if it's crap, I want to know it's crap. Or if this, you know, it's got this weird bug where you have to untighten this screw before you bleed it or yada, yada, yada. I want people to know this. So I try to encourage everyone to come back and lead a, lead leave a review good or bad we got our first ever like one star review uh just just last week which was for l2's uh rim brake 11 speed group set or something like uh, yeah some guy said no matter what he did he, he couldn't get it working and uh yeah i i sent him uh, i'm currently sending him emails and trying to make it right for him uh, but yeah i thanked him for leaving his review because you know that's what i want it to be like uh, warts and all if it's crap i want i want to know it's, I, I want to know it's crap and i want everyone else to know it's crap too so yeah group sets they're definitely well, a are thing they aware where, of the uh, are they aware I, of like I think the I way less we confidence in the current state of chinese group sets compared to say uh chinese wheels or chinese handlebars let's say i reckon one of the big issues and i don't know if they're aware of this is the fact that okay there's been product there's been issues with the products but they, they're obviously pushing out like updates to the product. They're like rolling updates to the product. I, I honestly think these guys would massively benefit from almost relaunching the product and saying like, okay, this is version two or this is version three or something like that and and putting a putting a stamp on right. here here is the final version. like this is the 2024 edition. Here it is. Do you know what I mean? because there's we're I think a lot of people in the West, holding off going oh, i'm going to wait for the final release yeah so i think this is the big brain move right so uh they're either incredibly smart or incredibly stupid and time will tell which one so um my one of my theories is so they need to play catch up with r d with the big brands right and so uh if they were doing behind the doors testing you know even if they had like a hundred cyclists each doing like you know a thousand kilometers a month like okay that's big miles but a much better way is what they're doing now like they're selling like tens of thousands of units of this and they're getting a lot more testing feedback now uh there's two positives for that from their point of view number one you have some cash coming in obviously because people are paying money for these group sets and number two you're getting so much more data like they are able to gather the same amount of data in like you know half year of testing that you ordinarily wouldn't be able to get in decades of testing uh, but obviously the flip side of that is that you're basically committing like brand all suicide like you, you're putting your brand into the into the dirt but maybe the big brain move is you do this for a short period of time to get a bunch of data to develop your product and then you rebrand yourself you come out with a new brand name or you buy a western brand like so I'm sure there are some struggling brands these days, perhaps even Campagnolo these days that may, might not be as strong as they were before, or Rota, or any of the ones who've dabbled in group sets before. You buy this brand, and then you, then you put out your new, now fully developed, fully, fully working product under that brand name. And as far as the Western consumers are concerned, who've never watched YouTube, they've just got a, you know, a, new, a brand new player to the group set game who's got a good product and uh, seems competent. Counterfeit frames. Is that still a thing? Remember back in the day, you'd get like the, the, the China Rello and the just legit rip-off counterfeit stuff. Is that still... Do you see that these days? Uh, yeah, so the counterfeit frame stuff. This, this, is, a, this is also a, a can of worms in itself. So there's a few different kinds of, of counterfeit frames or fake frames or whatever you want to call them. So uh, I'd say... At the very at the very top of it, we have uh, factory A is told by the brand to make 500 of this frame, but they make 600 of the frame, and the extra 100 frames they sneakily 
uh, sell to some guy who sells to some guy who sells to some guy who sells them. And then the, buy, the customer might buy them at the full retail price, thinking they're buying legit frames, yada, yada, yada. But if ever you have a right. problem and you go to check the serial number of the brand, the brand might be like, yo, that serial number doesn't exist. Or they might end their way up onto some secondhand uh, marketplace where the guy buying them, it's so cheap, you don't know if it's a fake or if it's out of the back door of the factory, etc., etc., etc. But then uh, why you shouldn't do that is, okay, so any legit factory isn't going to do that for a start. It's like the legit big factories won't do that because the risk of doing it and then the brand finding out, you'll get, you know, you'll get blacklisted for life. And all the brands will talk to each other and you'll never do any customer ever again. But, you know, factories are made up of people. And, and I, I grew up in the black country in, in England, like a super working class place back in the day. And like, you know, you used to be able to get like, you know, you had your mate, your dad's mate, Dave, who could, you know, sell DVDs out the back of his car or whatever. <laughs> and like, you weren't sure if they were like fake DVDs or if they came off the back of the lorry because the lorry got open for a custom inspection. I did it. Like, it's basically the same thing happens here. Like, there are some bad apples in the factories who uh, you know, might, might borrow some frames from the factory. Uh, one, of my, one of my friends who's uh, a Canadian but works in the bike industry and comes over here, he told me a joke that there was one factory that he went to and like, he'd go to the factory like every three months and every time he went to the factory, the walls of the factory were getting higher and higher because one of the things is you, know, you, you phone your mate to go stand over the other side of the factory wall and you're literally throwing frames over, <laughs> over the factory wall to your mate who's on the other side with his pickup truck or whatever. And so yeah, he joked that there was one factory that, well, it, he, he was joking, but it actually happened. The factory he went to, the walls were getting higher and higher each time he visited. And like, you know, barbed wire got added and then like CCTV got added, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there's no smoke without fire. They must be doing it for a reason. So I'm so glad you said that because that's like, in my completely stereotypical uh, mind, like I've just got this image of you like driving around like behind factories and there's just like these um, bins of Pinarellos and Bianchis <laughs> and you're like, oh, what will I get today? And you just like pick it up and take it home and like, oh, I'll build that up. And you've got like all this off camera just sitting there. I'm so, I'm gl I'm so glad that it's it's basically true is what you're saying. Well, uh, I can neither confirm nor deny, but like <laughs> I, I have some bikes that never go on camera for certain reasons. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, uh, the less said, the better. But so the danger of this is also at the back of every factory is the QC rejects. Like, yes. Uh, so, you know, it could have this problem or that problem. It could be literally unsafe to ride. Again, some unscrupulous individual or, or the factory knowingly uh, if it was a, a dodgy factory, they could also sell these frames. And then the person they sell to might go and put, a, uh, I'm not going to say a brand, but brand name X paint on the frame and then sell them to consumers who might legitimately think they're buying a legitimate thing or they might know it's what they're getting. But again, this is super dangerous. And like, you know, some of the frames, you know, you see frames online that have this problem or that problem. This could be where they came from, right? Uh, they could have been uh, factory seconds that got, got sold on dodgely. I'm not saying this mm. is a rife problem, uh, but it does happen. And so, okay, this is, this is like layer one and layer two of counterfeit frames. Then the next layer down is uh, other factory, uh, a rival factory to the, usually a smaller, dodgier factory. Like they might actually get their hands on the 3D files for the, for the frames. And again, like, uh, you know, I have 3D files get copied and emailed from person to person. And then before you know it, you've got all of the 3D files of, again, I don't want to use any brand names because last time I, I used some brand names and, I got in and someone got in touch with me. Uh, but yeah, so all of a sudden you have the latest and greatest, maybe even the unreleased frame from brand X because uh, let's say a big brand comes out with a new bike that they call the SL8. Like they've been making that frame for a year before anyone ever buys it. So uh, a dodgy factory might get the 3D files like six months before the customers get the hand on it. And then, so they can use these 3D files to make molds and then they can start making these frames. But they might not have the layup and the raw materials won't be the same and this, that, and the other. So this is where it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, but it's not a duck, it's a chicken. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you'll have factories doing that. And so this is like, yeah, the second, maybe the third layer of counterfeit frames where it looks exactly the same. It might literally be the same 3D files, but what it's made of and anything else, who knows? And there might be, there might be a few variants. You might be able to buy it without a paint job. You might be able to buy it with like the factory's own random brand paint job written on it, which will be just a bunch of letters that you can't even read. Or if you send them a private message and ask them, hey, can you give me a, a paint job with brand X's logo on there? They'll do it for you. Uh, yep, I'd avoid these as well because obviously um, you have, you've got no idea, you know, because when brand X designed this frame and this tube profile, they were made this tube profile thinking you'd be using like high modulus carbon fiber, but this factory might not use high modulus carbon fiber. Also certain tube shapes, it's hard to get good compaction of the, of the matrix of the carbon and the resin. And uh, this factory might not be good at doing that. And so, yeah, so definitely avoid these frames as well. Then the next layer of counterfeiting is like the guy sees a, a, a leaked photo of the SL8 before it's released online. And so he opens up his 3D software and just starts like, man, it's a bit of a blurry picture, but he starts trying to sketch it himself. <laughs> yes. That happens. Here we go. So it looks you like, you know, it looks like if you squint, it looks a bit like a, uh, an SLA or whatever. <laughs> and then it, one step further down is maybe like once the SLA comes out, the, the guy buys an SLA and he 3D scans it or whatever, and he makes molds from that. Uh, and, and yeah, so there's, there's all levels of quality of, of counterfeit or knockoff fakes, uh, fake frames and stuff. But then the line gets a bit blurry because then you get like frames that are just heavily inspired by another frame. But, you know, you've got, you've got two triangles. There's, there's a, you know, even, yeah. e even the big brand frames these days, if you put them all in silhouette form, there's lots of frames that start to look the same. And so lots of the, the smaller factories you know, if you look at 100 frames, you're going to find frames that look very, very similar. You know, almost every frame these days looks like an SL7. But I, don't, I wouldn't call them like counterfeit SL7 frames. They're just frames that look a lot like an SL7 because you've got two triangles and there's not that much you can do with it. And, uh, you know, dropped seat stays became popular. And so every frame ends up looking the same. So I'm kind of glad it's not a, it doesn't feel like it's, that element of the market isn't really relevant. Uh, maybe I'm delusional and I, it's just I'm, I'm missing it. But in the fashion industry, the, the counterfeit markets are huge. Whereas in cycling, from what I can see, there's, there's not that many people rocking around on a fake, uh, you know, I don't, yeah. I will also not say a brand now. <laughs> We're not saying brands, but you know, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, um, at least from what I've seen. Lots of brands out there, they have a guy whose job it is to find counterfeit stuff. Um, and so it must be a big enough problem if you're employing a guy and paying him like, you know, $50,000 a year to do this job or whatever. So uh, I could easily sensationalize it and, you know, say, you know, oh, everyone's writing fake frames and they don't even know about it. Um, but I don't think that's the case. I don't think it's that big of a problem, but it, it does exist as an issue for sure. One of the, the things we were chatting about last time is you were very much just starting out with the, the Panda Podium um, distribution model. Like I know Jesse's kind of interested in this and so am I. I, I would just love to generally ask, how is it going or what is it and how is it going? Yeah, yeah. So last time we talked, we've pretty much, you know, just, just gone live, the website and stuff. And uh, yeah, so now we've been going for like half a year. We just finished our first Black Friday, which is obviously always uh, fun, quote unquote. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been different to what I thought, but it's been better than what I thought. Uh, the cycling industry in China is booming now. So like all of these Chinese brands have realized there's a gold mine in China now. So they're not suddenly so interested in doing it overseas. So in terms of timing, uh, not the best timing. I would have been a lot better doing it like three years ago or whatever. But um, and yeah, it's been going really well. Like the, the kind of stuff that's been selling is probably different to what I thought. And like the, the kind of client is also different to what I've thought. With our product lineup, we didn't want to go to super cheap, super budget, super economy because we can't compete with like AliExpress. So AliExpress, like the government subsidizes their shipping. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day. Uh, they sell wheels on AliExpress. They can ship a pair of wheels from China to South Korea for six US dollars. 
Holy mackerel. Buy yeah. airplane. Six US dollars. Buy airplane. So it's just, it must be subsidized, etc. Et it, I it, Just, Joe, I, I noticed a similar thing. I didn't realize how much they did that because when I was uh, getting samples um, shipped over of kit that I was making and it was sh sent by FedEx, I was shocked at the price. Now, it wasn't uh -huh. overly that expensive, but it was, you know, for a sample of kit, much me like two pieces, would be 40 US dollars. Yep. Which is not, that's pretty, it's not that expensive. But yep. compared to a, the 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 AliExpress price, which is free, um, <laughs> is uh, yeah, it was, it, it was yeah, I was like, oh okay, like there's obviously something going on there. Let's say you know you've got a a two hundred dollar four hundred dollar wheel set and a two thousand dollar wheel set. Like the shipping cost is about the same because the box is the same size and they're more or less the same weight, right? So it makes more sense for me to sell like mid to high end stuff where the shipping costs as a percentage or a lower percentage of the overall cost of the wheels so yeah like our our product range is probably like mid to high-end stuff but the high-end stuff has been more popular than, than the mid-end stuff in terms of what people choose to buy it was interesting what you said about the the type of rider that's buying the products is not just someone looking for the cheapest thing and we discussed this a bit chris uh about a month ago about how it's it's a bit of a crowd now where it's it's part of the bike is is like the wind space wheels or the the craft wheels or some other kind of aspect of what's other otherwise a totally western branded bike but it's like a fashion piece to have your boutique direct from asia aftermarket bit added on it's not just people looking for yeah the cheapest part like we've definitely seen that on a lot of people's bikes it's now it's like something to be proud of it's like, oh, I've got this super light, unbranded saddle, and it's like the, the, the standout piece that makes your bike different. Is there, is there a hierarchy of, of brands that are cutting through? Because, I mean, the, the reason I ask that, like we, we've talked a little bit about Machine. Like I've felt that they've cut through into the, well, the, the if you know, you know crowd their mainstream if you know what i mean it's it's an acceptable kind of brand from that perspective is are there are there brands that have have made it through in the last 6 months i mean we kind of know fast sports to, at this point but are there any other ones that have that have cut through yeah interesting question so uh, just these days like you know everyone's doing the whole end of year stuff and i'm i've i've also got like some end of year awards that i'm doing from panda podium like recognizing brands and like you just said, Majin, they won like most influential Chinese brand of 2023 because like you say, like good, they've really good like, award. yeah, they've really like cut through it. And uh, yeah, like they're, they've got a full product range and you know, their marketing, they look like a professional company now, like a company that you trust your life to when you're going down a hill, which is what, what we want, right? And it obviously makes, makes my job a lot easier. But to answer your question, are there any other brands doing it? Like, I think it's, it, so it was definitely trending up. Like there was, in 2019, 2020, 2021, uh, people noticed that the brands that were succeeding, or I should say the companies that were succeeding in the Western market, the Chinese companies, were the ones that were not just focusing on products, but also focusing on the brand. But then one like Stepping Stone or like uh, a, 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 an amber light on this, I'd say, is that the Chinese market is exploding now. Like the demand for cycling stuff in China this year is through the roof. So all of these brands who were like uh, starting to warm up overseas have now realized, well, it's a lot easier if I just do it in China. And like, so you just mentioned EXS, like their office is literally 400 meters away from me down here. Um, they make an, uh, an amazing handlebar, but they just can't make enough of it. So very little gets left over for the overseas market because they can't even sell enough for the, for the Chinese market. So yeah, lots of brands that were starting to go in this direction of maybe like, paused a bit and just okay we'll just focus on the Chinese market but then some brands have missed out so the brands that were the successful brands in 2019 and 2020 and 2021 like the overseas direct -to consumer brands who we can all think of um, lots of those guys like sacrificed their standing in the domestic Chinese market to focus on the overseas market and now it's coming back around to bite them in the ass because now China 
the, the Chinese market has taken off and they've realized, oh, wait, uh, those, those dealers and all of those bike shops who I ignored for those years while I was focusing over, overseas, they no longer want to sell my stuff. So, yeah, it's, uh, the, 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 the tables have shifted a bit, as it were. Uh, but I definitely think those who are thinking for their lung game, they know that this current bubble of popularity in China it is going to burst. Or not burst, but you know it will go back down to you know pre-bubble levels, and then the biggest market will always be the overseas market. So there's definitely companies out there who are just you know, okay, we can sell stuff in China, no problem, but we're not going to totally throw away our overseas progress. Hang on, hang on. So the Chinese domestic market is booming, yep. right? So so what's the what's the Chinese YouTube? Uh, surely, but aren't the thumbnails all exploding? Doom and gloom. Everything's everything's sort of gone up in smoke. Do, why are we booming? Is this is this like is this a post COVID thing? Is there any have you got any take on why this is happening? Yeah, so hey, it's quite funny. Uh, you guys maybe a month ago, six weeks ago, did your show talking about you know how all these YouTubers are doing like these burning uh, <laughs> on fire factory thumbnails and stuff. I wanted to make like I had no time to make the video, but I wanted to make a video which was like you know roses and daffodils and mountains of money and just like the bike industry is booming um but yeah in china the bike industry is is going through the roof and um i think it's a combination of things so like you said uh covid in china lasted longer than other countries in terms of lockdowns and stuff and i think when that ended there was a lot of a uh, you know more thirst to be outdoors and then at the same time like from for whatever reason like uh, china has uh, I think I mentioned this last time as well, uh, like cycling in China now is like the golf, like it's the posh sport that if you're seen to ride yep. it, you know, everyone thinks you're well off, et cetera, et cetera. Like that effect just keeps growing stronger and stronger. And uh, mm -hmm. also racing, like so during COVID, like racing was basically non-existent, but now racing has come back like with a vengeance, like every weekend there's so many races going on. Is the is the average, uh, the, so Chinese uh, road cyclists now, are they are they still watching pro racing? Is there anything uh, from the West that they're getting into, or is it is, is it a whole bubble on its own? Like, are they watching the Tour de France? Or good question. Uh, so I I say like in the in the circle of cyclists, there's like sub niches and stuff, and this this new like trendy niche. Like I say, they're less into the racing side of thing and more into like the lifestyle side of thing. And again, I'm not gatekeeping. Like it is what you want it to be. Like you want a bike, I'm happy. Uh, but yeah, so the, this this new bubble that's expanding the quickest, I'd say they're not really into the racing. They don't really watch the racing, but you know they might know a few names from the Tour de France, and like you know they might choose their bike based on who won the Tour de France. Like Cervelo seems to be doing okay here, um, and yeah, so I'd say it's less of a less of a pro racing like fan club crowd, and more of just like you know a trendy a trendy new like. Uh, what would what would be the equivalent in the West? You know, like your your Rafa CC like uh, crowd or whatever. Just being just sort of being selfish for a second. Like, so you, the domestic domestic cycling is booming, blah blah blah. And so you see this kind of narrative when people talk about the bike industry now in the West. Like, you'll often see it. Oh, they deserve this. The bike industry deserve to suffer for a while, et cetera, et cetera. Because you obviously you see some of the layoff type things. Are we living under a bit of an illusion that the bike industry is suffering? Because is is there potentially enough of a a boom in the domestic Chinese market that will kind of make a soften the landing? Really, my my question is like, are the the Western brands gaining from this as well? Good question, and I think it depends like on the brand and how much they invested in in China previously. So. I think Canyon, if I'm not mistaken, they have no official distribution in China. So they're left going, whoops. And like yeah. you guys saw the news about Canyon's earnings recently, right? So I don't know if that's related, but yeah. yeah. And then you've got brands like Pinarello who've always been, uh, always had official distributors here. I think they've got two official distributors and always like supporting the uh, local scene. Uh, and yeah, so they're, they're reaping the benefits now. But I do think the West... The bike market in the West is generally hurting. Like, there's no, there's no doubt about that. Like, uh, the Black Friday deals were crazy. Like, <laughs> we got lots of crap on our Black Friday deals because, like, 
one of my whole things of Panda Podium is just, we're trying to simplify the shopping experience and make it less sensationalist. Yep. We don't want it to be like, you know, there's a sale every month and, you know, the prices get slashed to half price. We want it to be like good prices all year round. And so at Black Friday, like if you don't do Black Friday, people are going to be mad. So we did some bundles and stuff, and, you know, to be like 15-ish to 20% off on these bundles. And people were like outraged, like, why aren't you doing 50% off? I'm like, because I'm, <laughs> I don't want to go bankrupt. Like, <laughs> uh, So yeah, like I do think the bike industry is hurting in the West or they wouldn't be doing this stuff. And also the factories here, this has been super interesting as well. So all of the factories here in 2019 and 2020, when it started going up overseas, all of the big orders came. Now, all of the local factories, they all like, they brought new machines, they brought new factories, they expanded, expanded, expanded. Like everyone thought this was going to last forever. And now all of these Western brands have warehouses full of stock. So they've stopped ordering from the factories. And now these factories are going, ah, what do we do? And so for them, luckily, the Chinese market is booming. So they can, okay, we'll, we'll make our own domestic brand and use our factory to, to prop up that. So you've seen a bit, I don't, well, I don't know if you've seen, but there's been a few new Chinese brands emerging these days. Uh, like there's one called Bross, B-R-O-S-S. Yeah. I don't know if you, they've, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that yeah. is a similar, I think that yep. is yep. Uh, a result of the situation I just said, like, you know, factory uh, suddenly has a big factory with no orders coming in. What should I do? Well, cycling is booming in China. I'll make a Chinese brand and, and go with that. So yeah, I've seen lots of that going on. A brand uh, called Pardus, P-A-R-D-U-S. Like they also do, Lots of OEM for the big brands overseas, but their brand in China is also very successful. So for them, it's been perfect. Like the OEM orders went down. Okay, I'll just start pushing my own brand in China more. So uh, yeah, it's, it's worked out well for them. With your channel, so the China Cycling channel, um, obviously now you have like Panda Podium, which is um, distributing Chinese products. Essentially, a lot of the products that you have on your channel what, what and, and China cycling is, well, for, for a lot of us, is the first place we see a lot of the products that then become, you can buy on Panda Podium. How, how do, so I thought my question really is like, how do you balance this? Because, you know, you're, you're a writer, you, you enjoy doing reviews. A lot of your reviews are super honest and, you know, but ultimately, you know, you're also trying to sell some of these products. So is the future for your channel going to be continuing to do the reviews and the, that, that kind of stuff? Or, or how do you sort of see the two working together, I suppose? Yeah, this is like a, a super good question and uh, something that I think a lot about and, and, and spend more time thinking about than I should. Like one topic that I'm really interested in, and, and maybe we could, that, this is going to be our episode three if we do it one day, it's just like YouTube reviews in general, like, and how much should people disclose? And like, uh, for example, like commission systems, are commission systems a good thing or a bad thing? Because in, you know, you guys know as a YouTuber, you put a lot of work into making a video. Like, uh, you know, you've just built up your S5, you know, you're putting money, you're spending money to pay someone to build up this frame with parts and putting, putting time into it and stuff. And like every time a YouTuber puts up a, a review video on YouTube and the video can be 100% complete, you'll say everything. But as soon as the video goes up, in the comments, you'll get loads of people asking questions, but oh, but how does it really ride? Or you'll get a bunch of DMs like, oh, but is it really a good bike? And you're like, well, yeah, if I wouldn't have said it if it was. But like, so for me, commission is a good thing because, you know, YouTubers are putting their time into this thing and to introduce... If it's to generally introduce a good brand or a good product to customers, I feel like they should get rewarded for their time of doing this, right? And YouTube ad money is a joke. Like that's not the reward <laughs> these days. Um, and so commission in theory is this nice thing where everyone wins, right? The consumer gets a 10% discount. The YouTuber gets some money for putting the time into it. And the brand gets to sell, uh, sell more product. Yay, everyone's happy. But it completely gets abused or it's open to be abused. Uh, on, like, I, have, I have a lot, a lot, a lot of data about this because I work, obviously, w work with lots of YouTubers and talk to you guys and, and all the other guys. You know, we all have WhatsApp groups or messaging groups and stuff. And I know a lot about what goes on behind the scenes. 
And, uh, you know, you've got like brands trying to outbid each other in terms of how much commission they pay. And so then a YouTuber, when he's doing his end of year review of like which are the best wheels, is he going to actually say which are the best wheels or is he going to say the brand that gives them the highest percentage commission? Or is he going to recommend the wheels that are more expensive because, you know, 3% of a $2,000 wheel set is more than 3% of a $1,000 wheel set. So I think YouTube in general is, like, like I say, I love the platform. I, I think that YouTubers should be rewarded, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a topic for another, another conversation for sure. Like, I really think someone should do like a round table of like uh, brands and YouTubers talking about this, this issue because I feel like consumers who watch YouTube, they don't know a lot about what goes on behind closed doors. And uh, lots of the, there's a spectrum of YouTubers of how transparent they are as well. Like, you know, you've got YouTubers who start every video by saying like, yo, this frame was sent to me by Brand X or Brand X are paying me to make this video. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. But then you get YouTubers who I know are receiving product or receiving commission and they just don't mention it. Uh, which, you know, there, in certain countries, there's also laws about this and what you can and can't do. You know, do you need to put the little hashtag ad and put an ad thing on your, on your thumbnail? So this ties into me and China Cycling and Panda Podium, of course, because now I have this thing where, uh, of course, he's going to say good things about it because he's selling it. Uh, but I believe I've built my audience of like 50 whatever thousand subscribers because over a period of time, people who've built, bought my stuff in the past have had good experiences and then they come back and keep listening to my advice. And, the, the, the value of this audience and the trust this audience has in me, uh, you exploit that in the short term. Maybe you can sell like, you know, 50 sets of wheels before people cotton on. Uh, but long term, you can sell thousands of sets of wheels. So I'm never going to abuse this trust from my audience for a short term, like flash in the pan. Like if I said wheel brand X was amazing and then everyone buys it and they have a horrible experience, People are going to know, and like the comment section of all my videos, there's going to be people like flaming me. So, um, and and rightfully so. But yeah. So to go back to the question, I only want to review things even before Panda Podium. Like I only want to review things that I like. Like I've never been interested in like trying to you know get my hands on something that I think is bad and making a video ripping it apart. Like Hambini does that. He does it really well. But for me, especially in the beginning. The only thing I got from the brand was the product to keep my hands on it. So the, why would I want a bad bike? Like I want good bikes. So I do my research before I deal with a brand. And now, okay, I do my research. I find something I like. Uh, if I like it and it does ride well, then yeah, the next step is definitely that I want to sell it on Panda Podium as well. And so there's definitely this thing where like, you know, lots of these things you'll see on the channel are positive. And it, a cynic would easily say, oh, he's only saying good things about it because he's selling it and he wants you to buy it. Uh, yeah, of course, that's an, an easy conclusion to come to. But usually it's that I did my research way before and then I got my hands on it, I liked it, and that's why I started selling it. Uh, off camera here, we build lots of bikes. Uh, so we'll approach a brand and we'll tell them, you know, I've got this website, I do this, I do that. I've also got a YouTube channel. Uh, can you give me a frame for free as a sample to check it out? Most of the brands will say yes, but even if they say no, like I'll buy it with my own money. And so we have a bunch of frames built up here, which are all in the process of being either built up or reviewed or tested to go on the site, etc. It's It's a really cool process that goes through and I, something that I do want to show people like behind, behind the curtains of what goes on as well. Uh, and yeah, so we have this process of uh, we all ride it, we build it. I, I definitely think building the bike, you learn a lot about the bike, but still... At the end of the day, it's usually just a sample size of one or two frames. So will it be all of them? I'm not sure. So then, especially if there's a new brand that I've never sold before. So first of all, we'll ride it ourselves a lot. When we're building it up, we'll go over it with a fine tooth comb. But then especially like the first few orders that we have, uh, we will we'll be a lot more diligent on the QC of those frames than a, a, a brand that we've been selling for a while maybe. So yeah. That's what goes on, uh, but I feel like this will work a lot better if you guys ask me questions or you guys play devil's advocate, and, I, and I'll, I'll just respond to the criticism. When you said about the com like YouTubers getting commission, is commission good or bad? I just have a, a tidbit on that. In that, it starts to wear thin because if 
if you're watching someone's channel and then it starts to become the only reason they're putting up a video is so that there can be an affiliate link or some ad for a product in the video, don't you, you start to get sick of watching them because their only, their whole existence is there just to, to promote a link or to sell something. And that gets, like, there are some channels where that's a natural fit. I, I would say, uh, like, a, like a Dave Arthur. It's like, you're going there to look at a bike. You're basically going there to be sold something if you're watching a Dave Arthur video. But then there's other channels that maybe started more organically and then they do a few affiliate links and they realize, oh, that made money. And then they go, well, there's no point me just making a, a genuine video with no product to sell because obviously they're not going to make that money in that video. I feel like that's a shame because then you've got out of, let's say, the 10 people you follow on YouTube, if all of them are just making videos so they can just promote someone's affiliate link, you kind of lose the... There's a whole side of things that isn't just a review or chatting about a product that you then lose because there's no money in that. I'm like, that's a shame. I'll say the, the flip side of that. Like, so before I had Panda Podium, uh, I'd go and buy these, I'd, I'd buy these products because, you know, I didn't have clout back then. I'd buy these products uh, in China and I'd make reviews on them and I'd say, you know, this is a great product, yada, yada, yada. And then the, the comment section was just full of people going like, where do I buy it? Where do I buy it? Where do I buy it? And I don't want to, like, I buy it on Taobao, like the local marketplace. I don't want to give someone a link to some AliExpress seller who I have no idea, like, what service they're going to give. Like, will it sell them the same stuff and stuff? So this was kind of, like, also one of the catalysts for Panda Podium because I used to review this stuff and say it was good. And then people were all, all in the comments like, yo, where can I buy it? Where can I buy it? Where can I buy it? And so Panda Podium was also kind of born to just, okay, you can buy it from me. Like, there, I've, I've, I've solved the problem for you. Um, but yeah, you're definitely right. Like when it when it turns into a, you know every, everything's a, uh, an affiliate channel, uh, it goes it goes boring real quick. Like on my YouTube, I've never deleted a comment. Like that's one thing that I'll I'll I'm a bit I'm a big believer in uh, <laughs> free speech, which some people might think ironic given where I live. Uh, <laughs> but I've never deleted a comment. Uh, the only thing like those fake giveaway guys, like I'll mark that, I'll report that as spam. But I've never deleted a comment. But one comment that cut me pretty deep the other day was like one guy on my video, like I made a, f a bunch of videos during Black Friday and one guy was like, this channel has just turned into the China, uh, t turned into the Panda Podium shopping channel. And I was like, fair play, fair play, like that cut deep. But, yeah. uh, so now I try to balance the content a bit more, like I'll, like, you know, the Trigon, like I don't sell that and I'll just put it up there. People, people like it, people like it. I've got some videos coming. But that's why I... Yeah, go ahead. That's why I ask you the question, because you are in such a unique position. Like, it's all good and well. Like, I hear what Jesse's saying about, you know, affiliate links and all that kind of thing for, for certain people trying to make money and, and, and that. But you, as I said, like, you were, are, like, for a lot of us, the first the first impression we get on any of these brands. Like, oh, what's what's new? Uh, you know, even your walkarounds and some of, the, some of the expos and things like that. It's just like, oh, my God, look at this stuff from another planet. And I can totally, you know, I can totally understand for years and years and years, you just would have got, oh, wow, that's great, but I'm never going to be able to see that. You saw a space in the market, you've created Panda Podium, and, yeah, I, I, the, the, the fit is then is, is kind of awkward, but it's also perfect because, you know, you are, you are the, the kind of shining the light bulb onto a lot of these products, and now you've given us a safer place to to buy it. So I don't know. I, I kind of feel like with you, it's like put up or shut up. Like I'm just, whatever. I, I, exactly. I, well, that's what the channel was. We, that's why your channel was good. It was promo It was showcasing products, but it would be Chris. Like if you started just making every video, Oh look, I bought new aero socks. And then it was just the whole video existed. Cause you, so people would click at a link to buy them. And you just did that. That was just the videos you did because that's, you could make more money. Like that's where it would Maybe, be like. Oh, but then God. wouldn't wouldn't I then start an aero socks shop? Like you know, wouldn't no? Isn't it isn't it different? Isn't it like I I found, find this new aero socks brand and I introduce it to everyone. And everyone goes, wow, they're amazing. Where can I buy them? And I'm like, oh, hang on, give me give me a couple of years. And I go back and I build build this aero sock distribution company. And then on my videos, I go, no, okay, uh, uh, here are hold the new on, I'm not talking about and what Joe's doing. I'm talking about what most people oh, right. do, okay. which is like, 
they have a channel and then it doesn't really make them enough money so they just become this influencer affiliate link person not i'm not to- totally separate from what joe's doing which is starting a business giving people access to products they couldn't get before so yeah no no that's um yeah separate 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 sort of thing um but that's why as i said i mean people pe- pe- people are going to joe's channel because they're curious about buying a product most of the time like that's i want to see the new electronic chinese group set so i'm going to go to joe's channel like that's a natural that's what he's providing well yeah uh i think i encourage everyone to analyze everything i say i think lots of channels i think this is what jesse was also pointing to every video they make like this is the best wheel set ever this is the best wheel set ever and then next month it's like oh no this is the best wheel set ever this is the best wheel set ever and uh, I try to stay away from that as much as possible. And uh, as I alluded to earlier, I, I don't even believe there is a best wheel set ever anymore. So, uh, yeah, uh, everyone should be skeptic of what they see in the YouTube space. And, uh, yeah, take everything with a, a pinch of salt. We've probably missed the window, but what's the uh, – what's the pan- – now, now, pu- now we can push Panda Podium. I'm keen to push it. Let's, let's get on it. Um, What's what's the Christmas what's the best cycling Christmas present? I'm I'm tempted by the world's lightest mm-hmm. through axles. That's that's definitely yeah. that's in my wheelhouse. I could get around. Maybe that. someone that wouldn't be happy if they unwrapped that at Christmas. That is yeah. Legit. That's that's yeah. such a good I've present. Got, I've got a tidbit about this product too. So earlier you were asking me about the typical uh, Panda Podium customer. So I, I, yeah. I really really can't name names on this one. But we have world tour riders amongst our amongst our uh, <laughs> customers and like Jay Vine 100% bet he's bet he's buying I'll, I'll tell you all, I'll, after the after the show I'll I'll, I'll tell you a uh, I'll tell you who it is um but yeah like we'll have orders come in and I'll see the name and I'll be like is it that so and so uh, and maybe and I'll maybe I'll send like you know I'll have a look at the address I'm like I think that's where they live like go look on Strava is that where they're doing the training rights I'm like huh and then like maybe I'll send them an email being like oh you know, tell me to F off if you want, but are you so-and-so, so-and-so? And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and then I'll get in a huge a good nerdy conversation with someone about, about bike parts. So, yeah, we have world tour riders buying our stuff. We have, uh, uh, we have people who work for other YouTubers buying our stuff. Like we have performance managers for world, for world tour teams. Uh, we have, um, yeah, I... I I, I'm trying not to. On that, so what? What are they? You don't have to give specifics, but what? What are they buying? Is it those kind of lightweight little um, tricked out parts, or are they buying like wheels? But so, yeah. what happened with the? Uh, you just said the over fast through axles. So this world tour rider ordered some over fast through axles, and like, uh, sent me a mess in the order notes was like, make sure they get to me by X uh, of X month because there's a big race coming up, and I was like. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, I guess it is that guy. But I, I sent him a message going like, because they're overfast through axles, they're super light, they're super cool, but you installing and uninstalling them, you do have to baby them a bit. Like in the instructions and on the website, it says, you know, you have to insert the hex uh, head into like, I can't remember the exact number, but you have to put the tool pretty deep inside to make sure there's a good surface area, etc. Et and I was like, I was like, mate, you world tour guys walk around with freaking, uh, battery powered impact ranges like blah, blah, blah. like you guys you guys are going to chew these up in in <laughs> seconds and he was like no 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 it's just for like you know the time trial stage or it's just for like a one day race or something i was like okay as long as as long as you know what you're getting yourself in for so yeah um we have a few guys interested in those uh, uh i don't know if i can say yeah maybe i can say like the crw wheels uh the may or may not be uh, world tour teams uh, testing those behind closed doors and asking if they can buy them without logos to run in some races. Uh, so that's been really exciting. Um, and the, yeah, the yeah, feedback from from that guy was super cool. Uh, they're super down on board with those wheels, so that's going to be super cool too. And that and because like that's one thing that I happen as well. Like when I made the original CRW video, like I was because I genuinely do love the wheels. I was super. Uh, enthusiastic about the wheels and then so there's always this thing like is it just me or are they really good wheels and so when i get like uh the performance manager for a world tour team when he's finally shipping that email saying oh yeah the lab's been riding them and they love them and this and the other and oh 
I want to buy a set for my personal bike as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I see this feedback, I'm like, it's super validating that, you know, I'm not talking out my ass and people do like the stuff that I recommend. So yeah, that that's always a, a relief more than anything. Cause it, for me, like, as I alluded to earlier, like my, my, what's the word, uh, my credibility or like my, my seal of approval on a product, like that is, you know, that is my most thing of value. And as soon as I lose that, I lose everything. So it's always nice when you get the re- reaffirmation that your seal of approval is, is, is still worth something and people agree with what you're, what you're, what you're recommending. So we managed to convince you to come back on Joe, but that wasn't, wasn't, wasn't that. First of all, I just checked last show just ticked over a hundred K views. So that's super cool. Um, you. You're still the king. I'm, I'm You're still trying, the king I'm of trying. the guests. Uh, I was, I was giving. I often give the other YouTubers some shit for it. Like, uh, <laughs> it's become a thing. Don't, don't care about who's getting columns now. We care about who gets the most views on uh, the Nero show, or at least maybe <laughs> yeah. only I care because yeah. I'm at the top. But no, you guys are killing it with a podcast. Like, um, <laughs> I talk too much and I go off on tangents, and you guys did a really good job of like, you know, bringing me back and ma- making sure I, I speak uh, so people can understand and. Whoever edited it, I think Chris did a very good job with the edit. But no, after that show, so the feedback in general was was super good. Like I had so many people reach out to me and say like, oh, watch that show. That was super cool. Because when I was making that show, I have this balance to make, right? Like, so I need to spill the beans enough to make it interesting. But I can't just put everyone's dirty laundry out in the open. <laughs> and so when I was doing that show, it was like this balance. And I was a bit nervous of, of how it would be received. But like, I got industry yep. veterans, uh, like CEOs of, of, of brands reaching out to me and and saying like, yo, you hit the nail on the head. That's perfect. Like, thanks for sharing it with everyone. And like, that was a, that was a relief for, for one thing for sure. But now on the other hand of, of the side, uh, like, you know, I got, uh, I've got uh, other cycling journalists and old friends and, uh, and, and some riders reached out to me as well saying like, yo, that was cool. Thanks for doing it. Yada, yada. So kudos to you guys for that. But then uh, in the last video, we talked a lot about a certain brand. Uh, I'll, not, I'll not name them now, <laughs> but at the time we, talk, we talked a lot about a certain <laughs> brand and uh, which factory the certain brand makes in and like whether or not they're using the same layup for the pros as the what the average Joe buys. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then your video went up and then like 24 or 48 hours later, I get a message on my phone. I get a friend request that says, I'm so-and-so, so-and-so from brand X. So I'd like to talk to you. I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it turns out it wasn't their legal department. It wasn't their marketing department. It was actually one of their like high up uh, composite engineer guys. And it just so happened he was in uh, Shaman at the time as well. And I was like, huh, this is either the how they get me with the honey truck and like, I'm going to go there to meet this guy. And they're actually going to put a bag over there. Shake, shake. Yeah. He's gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you never hear from me again, this is what happened. Uh, but no, so it turned out this guy uh, was a super, super chill, cool guy. And like, so I accepted this frame request and then he said, oh, I saw the show. It, it was super cool. But there were some things in there which weren't quite technically correct, and I was like, "Sure, cool. Uh, I'm open to credentials." I'm like, and it was like, I was like, "Well, tell me what was wrong." It was like, "Oh, do you want to meet up sometime?" And so uh, I said, "Yeah, let's meet up." Yada yada yada. And then we arranged to meet up, like, in a, we said we're going to do a ride together at the weekend. And then so it's the middle of the week, and I was doing a, one of my random uh, training rides, and my training ride goes past the factory that Brand X uses. So just as a whatever, like I took a photo of the factory back door as I went past and I sent it to him and uh, and then I put my phone in my back pocket and did my ride. And so then as I'm doing my ride, and this was like uh, middle of summer, like it's super hot in the middle of the day in Shaman, I'm going up this hill climb and uh, there's I see a guy in the distance and like it's like 36 degrees, super humid. There's a guy going like full David Goggins, like no t-shirt on just running up this like seven percent hill <laughs> i get closer and closer and there's like i've seen i've seen more me on a butcher's pencil this guy is super ripped going super hard and i'm like fair play to you man and then i get to the top of the hill i come down the hill i see the guy again and it looks like a chinese guy so i'm just like yo 
and I do my thing. He does his thing. Then I get to the bottom of the hill and I check my phone, and the the guy has replied to my message going, "Ah, I've just left uh, the factory. And I'm going for a run." I'm like, "Was that the guy I just <laughs> saw?" Hang on. And so I sent him a message like, "Is it on this climb?" And I, I said the name of the climb that we were on, and he sent me a message going, "Yeah, I just saw a guy on a bike. Was that you?" And I'm like, "Huh." And so it turns out this like <laughs> composite engineer guy is a freaking superman of an athlete. Like he was full on going full gas up this climb, like running. And like, so I wait for him to come down the hill. We have a bit of a chat, yada, yada, yada. Super chill guy, super nice, super knowledgeable. And we talked a bit about some of the mistakes I made. Uh, and like, so the big thing was like, they don't actually use special layups for the pros anymore. Uh, you know, I only have his word to go by, but he seems like a nice guy. So yeah, sure. Also, I'll officially correct myself that what I said last time about Brand X using press, uh, special layups, uh, as far as I've been told, that is no longer true. It is something that was apparently done before, but it's not done anymore. So I just love with that story. So just with that story, because we were we were sort of texting and communicating. We were chatting even after, like, you know, oh, it went well, blah, blah, blah. I hope you enjoyed it, edit, blah, blah. We'll do it again, et cetera, et cetera. And then you were like, oh, this guy from Brand X has reached out to me and wants to meet up, right? And and you, and then that that was kind of sitting in the chat for like three days. And I'm messaging you back, going, Joe, 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 and, and Jesse and I are like, oh well, that was the end of Joe. Then he's been, he's been yeah, yeah. Uh, whisked away by uh, Brand X, never to be heard of again. And then. And then anyway, a few days later, oh, no, I was just out of reception, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, guys. Uh, but it turns out it's actually just a yeah, just nice, nice guy, guy and met up with him. Just on that, Joe, I actually don't I don't think you necessarily need to feel – I don't think you should feel bad about that. Sure, it's like good to come on and correct yourself. But if you say something with information you have from a, a source or from someone you you think is telling the truth at the time and you say it, this is a thing that happens on the show all the time is we might say something and then – Someone says, oh, you know, you're incorrect on that, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's a public forum. There's a comment section. You know, if a brand wants to come in, because they watch the bloody show, they're listening, so they can come on and correct it if they want. But we hear all the time of, oh, you said something about someone and that was incorrect or a brand doesn't agree with this. Well, they could come and leave a comment. We can pin the comment at the top and... They can correct the record if if they want, and I haven't seen a lot of that. It's a lot of, um, you know, talking off record or talking, you know, um, basically behind the show, and not actually correcting anything publicly. Um, so I just want to say that, like, it is YouTube, it is public. If we say something wrong and a brand wants to, um, state that that was not true, they can leave a comment. Chris will pin it at the top, and they can. They can make us look like idiots if they'd like. We've had two. We've had two examples. So Argon and Standard are the two brands that have reached out and commented in a public forum and clarified something that we've said, and it's just been out there for people to to discuss now. And and like Jesse said, we know pretty much every other brand we discuss talks about it behind closed doors and doesn't do anything. So yeah, shout yeah. to those two um, guys. Yeah. So uh, I don't want to be you know because. The last video, especially, and this video, like, you know, it's like, oh, you know, he's spilling the beans on the industry, blah, 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 blah. But, like, I don't want to be saying sensationalist things, and then if they're not true, just, like, going, oh, fuck it, they're not true, I don't care. Um, no, like, you know, I think, you know, you just have to have some, again, back to the whole credibility thing, whatever, like, if I'm wrong, I'll put my hands up and, and, and say I'm wrong. So, yeah, fair enough, so I was wrong on that one. But, yeah, like, I also want to say officially and legally, like, everything I say in this podcast is just my own personal opinion. Uh, and everything is just uh, what I've heard allegedly and don't take anything I say as factual. But at the end, just to finish off the story, I ended up riding with that guy at the weekend and yeah, he ripped my legs off and I think like it was uh, it was just desserts from me talking smack about his brand. So yeah, don't don't talk some I think I I, I titled the I titled the ride on Strava. It was like don't talk smack about engineers from brand X or the, uh, don't talk smack about brand X on YouTube. Otherwise uh, engineers will come and rip your legs off because that guy <laughs> it, it was 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 a strong rider and uh, yeah uh, schooled me proper hard. So uh, I no doubt he's watching this. So uh, yeah, I'm ready for round two. 
All right, Joe. Well, on that note, um, I think we'll we'll just agree to. Uh, I did. I loved your idea about um, like a reviewers forum. I definitely think we we do something like that, and we'll um, hundred percent check back in. But again, thank you so much for for coming on, being candid, uh, giving us an insight into what's going on over there, and an update into Panda Podium. And I think this comes from both Jesse and I that we we are really really. Like excited and and proud to know you and and proud um, that this is well this this is a huge potential um, change for for the industry and and we, we're um, yeah super excited about it so long way we me saying we'll do it again thanks and, Joe uh, yep. thank you so much for yep. coming thanks on Joe. Joe.